Hello everybody and welcome back to part three of our uh, Carver MXR 2000 uh, receiver video. And in part three what we're going to do is we're going to kind of pick up where we left off with part two on the magnetic field power supply and we're going to now look at what Carver calls the magnetic field amplifier. And uh, before we start that, I'd like to show you that uh, the owner actually sent a few things in. Uh, first of all, he had an original uh, owner's manual, which I thought was really cool for this. And, but wait, there's more. <laughs> he actually found one of these big old clunky remotes. Uh, pretty cool, huh? Has like the little, has an aluminum faceplate and has these little three score marks. So this tab just kind of floats up and down here, and underneath it is a little blister switch. And uh, infrared, and what I've read from some of the for forums out there is that this amp was really susceptible. It was kind of an old school, uh, early infrared remote, and it was really sus uh, susceptible to fluorescent lights and things. It would false trigger and everything else. But I thought that was kind of cool. In addition to that, he sent us a full set of knobs. Uh, so now <laughs> our receiver has a set of knobs on it, so she's getting dressed up. Anyway, before we start on the amplifier itself, I wanted to, I just, I can't believe how many comments, questions, and how many emails I received uh, after doing part two of the video. Um, how many of you were really, really interested in the way the magnetic field carver amplifiers worked. I was really kind of surprised by that, but I, I'm glad that it's something that uh, a lot of you found interesting. But uh, I thought that I should take a few moments here to address a lot of the questions and comments and things that I had um, regarding how the transformer works. Now, we talked a lot about the triac and all that, but let's get back to the basics of the transformer. There's a lot of things, and I read them out there a lot. I read all kinds of conflicting things um, as I started studying this a little bit to learn more about it myself. And one of the things that keeps reoccurring is the fact that, that the transformer they use is some sort of a special transformer that uh, cannot work on mains voltages or anything like that. Well, that's only partially true. Uh, let's back up a little bit. The transformer that's used in a magnetic field amplifier uh, at its root is a basic normal transformer. But, here's the caveat, the transformer is physically smaller than the amount of energy that it actually needs to provide to the circuit. That's number one. Number two, um, it can output a higher voltage than the actual rail voltage uh, of the amplifier is. What I mean by that is that if we're looking for a 70 volt uh, power supply, the amp if, if you just connected the transformer up to mains voltage, it would actually output more than that, like 80 volts or 90 volts, whatever. Um, and you, we would have to hook it, take it out of the circuit and connect it to test it. However, as soon as you connect some sort of a big load to that transformer, it would saturate very easily because it really isn't designed to deliver the kind of current that uh, you normally would see. And the way they get away with that is by using pulsed, uh, pulsed voltage into it. And that's another thing I want to kind of explain how it works uh, with the triac. So if you look down here, we just have three little pictures I drew. And, uh, of course, I'm a terrible artist, so don't, <laughs> got to forgive me for that one. But if we look here, let's imagine this is our normal AC mains voltage, okay? So in, in the states here, we're just going to use 60 hertz, but this is the same theory if it's 50 hertz, doesn't matter. Same idea. So if this is 60 hertz, that means that each half cycle is 1 120th of a second, or like 0 0.0083 seconds long. So it's a very short time, but it is a fixed time, okay? So from this point to this point is 1 60th of a second, okay? Or about 16.7 milliseconds. Now, 
on a normal transformer this is what's going to go into the transformer and this is the same frequency that's going to come out it will be a sinusoidal waveform and it will look just like this only with a different amplitude based on if it's a step up or step down transformer and we beat that one to death so we all know that already but what I want to really focus on is this okay so if we look here we have the same waveform drawn here but we're using our little triac circuit now and the little dashed line here that I poorly drew represents the outline of our 60 Hertz waveform and the shaded in area represents the part of the uh, the part of this waveform that the triac is turned on and conducting so at right at the time that this sine wave hits its peak in this particular instance we are turning on the the triac now because of that your mains voltage coming in is sitting at its peak and of course at 120 volts that's going to be roughly 170 volts uh, at that point because RMS voltage of course is 1.4 is uh, 0.707 of your peak voltage and your peak voltage is 1.414 of your uh, RMS voltage so if you take this times 1.4 you're gonna come out somewhere around 170 volts so on the primary winding of that little transformer you are actually seeing from zero volts you are seeing an instantaneous uh, presentation of 170 volts and of course because of the way a an inductor works okay Eli the Iceman I don't know if any of you have ever heard that but voltage leads current in, in an inductor if we apply that voltage that entire voltage will be present across that coil instantly and shortly thereafter it's going to be followed by a big inrush of current and that current since since we're not building that voltage up slowly and the currents kind of lagging behind it we're putting all that voltage there at once and you got a big current pulse that'll follow up behind it at that point in time this will stay on and as the the mains voltage starts to diminish and go back towards zero everything will kind of settle back down the same thing happens when the poles reverse there will be a wait period until that triac until your circuit senses that that peak it's going to fire the triac and again dump all of that energy at once into the coil in the opposite direction in the primary so you essentially it is not a high frequency transformer so a lot of people make the mistake of saying well it's a high frequency transformer it can't work at mains remember this is still 60 Hertz and this this whole thing is still only occurring 60 times per second and each one of these is still only a hundred and twentieth of a second it's just that it's not turned on for the entire hundred and twentieth of a second hope that makes a little bit of sense so at its maximum that magnetic field amplifier is going to be turned on just a little bit over half so maybe right around here it'll kick on and all of this will stay on and then it'll go down and then again the same thing will happen on this side and that's going to be when you have the volume turned all the way up and you're drawing max current but those pulses that that current pulse is actually what is feeding your capacitor banks and allowing that transformer to th this this here is recovery time for that transformer unlike a, a conventional mains transformer where this is going to be doing work all the time so that's kind of how they get away with it so it does work on the same concept of a switched mode power supply however it is not varying the actual frequency it's kind of more varying the duty cycle or the you know, of this of this particular waveform now let's let's do something else this will be maximum output so you would actually be applying 170 volts to the primary of the transformer right so if we put 170 volts into that transformer 
we're going to have our maximum voltage output of that transformer that we can get. But what if we wait? What if, what if we take that triac, we wait all the way up to our peak, and then when we hit the peak, we still don't fire the triac, and then on the downswing of the cycle, when we, let's say this is 100 volts, at 100 volts, I fire the triac. I am only going to apply 100 volts to that, to that primary at that point in time. And of course, there will be a lag because of Eli the Iceman, but eventually, you will have an output of that transformer that's actually lower than if you fired the triac at its peak. And that's how this little circuit, it's pretty ingenious really, after I really looked at it for what it was, that's how this thing regulates the voltage. The other thing is, because of this, this transformer actually can output a higher voltage with no load on it than, than you really need. So, believe it or not, you know, there's an adjustment and it is a power supply adjustment on all of these amplifiers. There was one on the M400 cube amp when we did the video on that. There was another one in the uh, Silver 9Ts. And those adjustments, and it, it even tells you to be careful in the manual, those adjustments allow you to set the maximum point at which this turns on. And of course, if you turn that pot too far, you find out very quickly that the power supply will even exceed the maximum voltage rating of the capacitors in the power supply and it causes the capacitors to fail. There's a lot of things I've read and I, I was very skeptical about these amps when I started to learn about them because this is really this is only the third Carver amp I've ever worked on. You know, the, you saw the first two in my first two video series on Carver. So I'm learning along with you guys. and one thing I learned was this thing is not designed, I mean, you have to have this thing adjusted properly or it will damage itself. And I think when I hear a lot of these things out on the forums and everything, it makes me think that possibly what's happening out there is the amplifier is misadjusted or due to normal aging of old components, things drift. And then the other thing I noticed is if it's a 70 volt power supply, Carver often will use a 70 volt maximum rated capacitor. And even though some capacitors have a little leeway to exceed their maximum rating, uh, it's still, you're pushing, you're pushing that component. So, and then add to that the fact that it's misadjusted by five or 10 volts, you can really cause damage. And of course, when a capacitor shorts, everything attached to it gets shorted with it. So uh, you have a lot of damage. So if these amplifiers are, the components are in good condition and they're properly adjusted, this circuit would work very well. And this is how it regulates by, and if you notice from our last video of the magnetic field amplifier, as I increase the volt or the, uh, the volume on the amplifier and it started command demanding more current from the power supply this started you saw this line you know because you would just see that line that looked like this and then it would go over and then you'd see this and then as we would as we would uh, turn the volume up on the amp you'd see this part here kind of creep over and over and over and that's that's what was happening it the triac was firing closer to the peak Okay, so I just wanted to clear, clear that up with all of you of how this thing works. That's what it's doing. It's controlling when to turn this on. And as we said earlier in the first, in the second video there, this is a self-extinguishing circuit. It can't turn off. You can turn this, this triac on, but now you're, you have to go along for the ride and you have to ride it all the way down to the ground here <laughs> till we get to zero before it can turn off. So all that we're doing is controlling when we're turning the triac and the circuit on and letting it finish its cycle by itself. Okay? So I just wanted to take that little bit of time at the beginning of this video to clear that up. And I hope that helps you all out. Um, it definitely took me a while to get my mind wrapped around it because when you first look at something new that you haven't seen before, it kind of takes you a while to figure it out. Um, if any of you have had any experience working with these and, and or worked for Carver or whatever and would like to put some comments, I'd love to hear them. I'm sure everybody else would. 
because uh, this stuff, at least to me, it's really interesting. I'm really enjoying learning this. All right, let's move on. Okay, we're now looking at the 30,000 foot view uh, of the amplifier section of our MXR2000. And over here deals with um, all of our signal switching and all that. And we talked about this a little bit. This, the, for instance, this TC9152 uh, integrated circuit. And this deals with your, this is, this is an electronic switch that controls all your inputs. Uh, so you can digitally switch your inputs out without actually having a physical um, contact switch to switch the actual jacks to the input of the amp. So that's what this is. This is all signal switching and things like that. Look at all the op amps. <laughs> uh, so that's what that part is. And of course, you know, your preamp, all those things. But really what we're concerned about is we we looked at this section last video, which is the power supply. We're now going to focus on this part of the amp right here. And this is your actual power amplifier. Uh, this is this is really where where all the uh, the magic happens for your speakers. So let's see if we can get a little bigger view of this and look at it a little more closely. Okay, I have a little bit bigger view of the amplifier section, and you can see your your right and left channels. Here's your two channels. And the real thing that I want to focus on, if you if you kind of just look at it at face value, right here. This just essentially looks like a regular class AB amplifier. You have your, you know, push pull. You have your NPN section, which has your positive rail voltage. You have your your PNP trans output transistor, and that is your actually your negative rail voltage there. And then of course you have your current limiting resistors, and then this center part that I have marked in the pink marker it eventually finds its way out through the little the little uh, network here and the Zobel network and over here into your relay and this is of course your protect relays and that goes out to your speaker terminals so this is your speaker output and really if we ignore all of this um, it really kinda looks like a basic class AB amplifier but really, this is more than a class AB amplifier. And of course, Carver is known for this. And contrary to popular belief, I'm starting to find out, and this was my first lesson, that not all of his amps are designed the same. Uh, a lot of, I, I was made to believe originally that all of his amplifiers worked off of the very same design, and he just scaled it up or down based on how many watts. But that's not entirely true. Um, I see two different types, classes of amplifier that that he uses, you know, the topology. And this circuit here is what makes it different, okay? And the two types of amplifier I want to talk about in this video that pertain to Carver amplifiers, and then we'll talk about the specific one used here, are two classes that are not very often heard of called a class G, G as in golf, and class H as in hotel. So class G and class H amplifiers aren't something that are commonly seen in your consumer grade stereos. Uh, most consumer grade stereos are very traditional design class AB push-pull amplifiers and normally you don't get into the class G and class H things until you get into pro audio where the big concern becomes reliability, uh, con conservation of, of you know energy, you know heat uh, so they don't get hot and uh, durability and the ability to, to put out very very high power uh, public address amplifiers that are used in concerts and things like that have to output a whole lot of power because you have to cover a very large area with sound. So let's first start by talking about the class G and the class H amplifiers. Okay, so <laughs> the first part of the debate starts out with class G and H 
getting a proper definition of them. Um, the more I tried to look up and research and get a definitive answer on what class G and class H amplifiers are, the more conflicting information I got. As a matter of fact, if you want to know, know a different definition for it, just go to another forum or another website and you'll get the opposite. Even good old reliable Wikipedia, when you go to their website on amplifier classes, has a big old note on there that says that uh, the, uh, <laughs> the information may not be accurate. So that's why I called this sheet class G and H, which is which. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which one is which, just so you understand the differences and the similarities between the two. So let's start out by saying that uh, the first one we're going to call rail switching. What do we mean by that? Well, let's take a look at a standard class AB amplifier. Okay, we have a little uh, Pioneer amplifier schematic here, and this is just a really basic classic class AB amplifier. And if you notice, we have your two outputs. One is an NPN, one is a PNP. We have our negative 30 volt rail on this side and our positive 30 volt rail on this side. So there's a differential power supply. And if you notice right here, we have a potentiometer. And that's actually going to be our bias pot. And the reason we have a bias pot is, of course, with push-pull amplifiers, one half of, of the circuit will handle the positive going part of the waveform and the other half will handle the negative going part of the waveform. The problem is there's a point in which that transistor will uh, be, both transistors will be turned off. And the, and the problem with that is for that little split second of time that, that the transistors are both turned off, there is no signal and that no signal we refer to as crossover distortion. When it crosses over from the positive going this section to the negative going section, you actually will have a period of time where there will be no signal. It will cause a distortion. So what we do is we add what's called a bias voltage. In other words, we never let these transistors completely turn off. They're both turned on just a little bit above their, their turn on point. And that keeps them from both being turned off at the same time. So there's going to be a very short period of time when this one hands off to this one that they're both going to be turned on at the same time. And that's what we call class AB. So right here we see our waveform. Well, for a standard push-pull you would have this Q8 up here would handle the first half. Q11 would handle the second half but really this would not be an accurate signal. There would be a little bit of a gap right here and right here where there would be no signal. And that's called your crossover distortion. Whereas right here, those little dotted lines I put would be like your bias voltage. So as this, this transistor is being turned off right here, it's moving into the section where this transistor is still turned on then it turns off and then this one's already on and it continues and vice versa. So that's what class AB is. That's how it works. And a class H and class G amplifier are the same thing. They operate in class AB. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, all these letters, huh? How confusing. But the truth of the matter is, don't, don't overcomplicate it. This is a very basic little amplifier. This is a Pioneer, I think this is like an SX450 or 550 or something like that. You know, like a 20 or 30 watt amplifier. Nothing fancy, but even these great big ones work on the same concept. You know, they double up the transistors to handle more current. They put higher rail voltages. And really up until this point, the way that we had a made a more powerful amplifier is to put bigger transistors and higher rail voltages. And of course because of that class AB all of that stuff is turned on all the time somewhat. So they're producing heat. The other thing is at very low voltages 
you have to basically you have to put that whole extra voltage across this transistor that's not going out to the speaker so at low signal levels you're dropping all of this rail voltage almost except for a little bit going out to the speakers into your transistors so that's what class G and H were designed to deal with so let's take a look at the first one okay the first one we're going to look at is rail switching and again uh, class G or class H it depends on what 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 you look at so you can call it either class G or class H um, just for for uh, simplicity let's just call this class G which we refer to as rail switching now in rail switching what we're doing here is we have a cascaded set of transistors on each side you see so you have instead of just having your two transistors like you did on the little pioneer design you see how you just had rail voltage up here transistor speaker terminal transistor rail voltage we don't have that here so what's happening is again this whole circuit here is operating in class AB so it's still biased a little bit so this is a very simplified drawing so you can't go by by this exactly but there is bias on here so what will happen is under low power circumstances so low amplitude signals you actually have a lower voltage so let's say this would be 35 volts and this would be 70 volts I'm just using these numbers as examples and this would be negative 35 and negative 70 under normal circumstances and these diodes are what we would call the commutating diodes and their purpose is to keep this rail from intermingling with this rail here so essentially what's going to happen is as we turn these transistors on and they start to conduct when we get up to anything that's below this amplitude here this transistor handles the whole signal so at low volumes this is acting as a normal two transistor push-pull amplifier however if we overdrive this and this goes up even higher what ends up happening is that this transistor will begin to turn on and it's turning on because if you look we're looking at this feedback here from your from your amplifier these are avalanche diodes and when we overcome that avalanche which is set kind of to where this range is this will begin to turn on and it will begin to apply this voltage down to here when this switches and it's very abrupt when it switches this point goes from being a 35 volt rail to a 70 volt rail so there's no there's no waveform up here it's either on or off and this can switch very very abruptly and very very quickly so anytime there's a loud peak this will just pop on real quick this voltage jumps up to 70 volts and this is now becomes a higher power amplifier now understand that because this is here this transistor is not handling the entire load <laughs> for that second um, it kind of splits between these guys so it's it's a neat design and it's really in there that think about it when you when you're running low low amplitude signals this guy's turned off you don't have your 70 volt rail here so you're not dropping that great big amount across this transistor here so that's how they're doing it now if you look at the carver like the M400 cube and the silver 9T they work in this this very same manner the only difference is they took it a step higher and they put a third rail so there would be you know they have like a 25 a 50 and a 75 volt or a 25 50 and 100 volt rail depends on the amplifier the higher the higher the output of the amplifier 
the higher your rails are going to get and the more stages you can get involved. And if you look over here, they're trying to give you kind of a representation of what's going on. So anything that's in the blue zone is being handled by this voltage and this set of transistors here. So this whole circuit can handle this. So think of this, if it was a low amplitude signal like this, this guy would never come into play. It would all be handled by the blue section. However, when we get beyond that avalanche threshold here, this guy trips on, this 70 comes down here, and now we have the expanded voltage around here. Now you can see where there could be a problem here. If, if these things don't switch fast enough, um, you can have a crossover distortion at this point. And conversely, if it doesn't switch off properly, you can have a cross, another artifact in this section here. So um, this circuit has to work properly. You have to have careful component uh, design. It has to be biased properly. Everything has to be lined up properly <laughs> or this doesn't work. It, it will actually sound really bad. And what will happen is if you're getting these little crossover products, it will sound very harsh. Um, you'll still hear the amplifier and it will still get louder and softer. It's just that when it's going through this section, you're going to create all kinds of distortion artifacts that you're going to actually hear. So this has to be a well-designed circuit for it to work properly. And again, this is a very simplified drawing. All right. So I hope that clears up what that one is. That would be the, we're going to call this class G, which is rail switching. Now for the class H, I couldn't really find online a good representation without a big complicated circuit. So we're going to try something else here and I kind of see what we got. Now back to this rail modulation or class H type amplifier, I was unable to find a good circuit diagram to show as an example. Uh, most things if you look up when, it, when you call for class H, they show the class G. And if you look up class G, it shows both of them will show up as just normally will show up as rail switching or this type of amplifier. But the actual one that modulates the voltage without getting into highly complex circuits with MOSFETs and all kinds of op amps and feedback, you really can't find a simple block diagram of a class H amplifier. Now, the reason I'm talking about all this is that it really took me a while to understand what's going on on this Carver 2000 amplifier because it is unlike anything that I've really ever worked on or seen. So let's take a look at this real quick. So here's a, a uh, close-up of one channel of the MXR 2000 amplifier. And I kind of tried to color code some of the sing signal paths to make it a little bit easier to follow. And if you look on the left here, or on the right here, we have our negative 50 volts. And then we have our positive and negative 70 volts. And then we have our positive 50 volts, which is right here, this purple wire. Yeah, you have positive 50 and you have negative 50 is right here. So this is actually positive 50 right here. And this is negative 50. Okay. So if you kind of look at this first look, you have positive 70, you have a set of transistors, your positive 50 volts or 40, it actually reads in the 40s, like 43 volts, 45 volts. Another set of transistors, and by the way, these are tied together. If you look, the collectors are tied, and the emitters are tied through these current limiting resistors. And then it goes down to your speaker terminal. So at first glance, this looks like a typical rail switcher amplifier until we do this.
if you take a look at both channels together you will notice that this section up here that deals with the the commutators and deals with the 70 volts this whole section controls both channels you heard me so when we look at this again these control up here but they also go down here if you notice they go off the page and the reason that they, they go off the page is because they're going down to the other channel so how does that work well right here where I made these X's on here it's kinda hard to see but these sections are actually taking samples of both the right and the left channel if either channels amplitude goes up this will go up with it and there is no avalanche circuit so it looks to me as this is somewhat of a class H and that it will modulate the voltage and it will raise the voltage the available voltage of that switching rail to the highest channel if that makes sense to you <laughs> so essentially what this is doing is you have one high voltage rail sharing the high voltage and can and modulating it based on demand of the highest of the two channels does that make sense so as a normal class a b amplifier you have your your two outputs here okay so you have a set outputs here and outputs here and this is pretty simple and it's running off of the 43 volts so you have plus and minus 43 but as the amplitude increases beyond that it's actually going to turn this circuit here on and bias it up to allow this 70 volts to surpass the 43 volts and add to it and increase our rail here as needed so is that a wild circuit or what now this does not exist even on the expensive silver 9t's it doesn't exist on the on the cubes um, I don't rec I mean they were normal three three stage rail switchers where you had a 25 a 50 and a 90 volt or 75 volt depending on the amp this is only done in two stages and this stage here is shared common between the left and right channels isn't that wild I thought that was I just thought that was so cool um, again it's still a rail switching in a way in that uh, you know that, that this these can take over f for these but really that in another way it's not because this isn't this isn't actually handling part of the waveform it's just raising this rail voltage here based on demand so this is more to me of a class H than it is a class G I don't know um, I'm just gonna tell you right now this is kind of above my pay grade and uh, <laughs> I kind of understand what they're doing now and I think it's really 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 fascinating but if any of you can shed more light on this I mean I'm more than willing to hear it because I would love to know more about this um, again as far as innovation and doing something different and really pushing the outside of the envelope I think this is doing it <laughs> so let's go back to here and again you can see that this circuit not only can feed up here okay this side but it also feeds down here this side so and it's tied in these these two transistors just handle the positive and negative 70 volts and they're even tied together through these steering diodes these are commutators as well I guess you'd call them and you have these little hundred ohm resistors 
one here and one here and one of them ties into channel the channel first channel and the other one ties into the second channel so it's actually taking samples from both channels and going into these drivers and then these drivers are driving these big transistors and these big transistors are adding voltage to this rail here upon demand now the thing is if one channel is really loud and the other channel is really soft both channels are still getting that extra voltage but only for the period of time that some channel needs it so now that we had a chance to take a look at this crazy thing let's get the amp back up on the bench and let's take some measurements I now have the dummy load connected to the uh, amplifier so we have an 8 ohm dummy load back here and I have the oscilloscope set up on dual channel and you can see I have both traces set up and actually I have my times 10 multiplier on my dummy load so actually this is reading 50 volts per division rather than uh, uh, 5 volts per division and this is actual readout and we're connected just so I have that extra little level of uh, isolation uh, I'm just going to use the differential probe just to again we don't want to mix our grounds around through the scope so anyway channel 1 right now we're just taking a look right here at the output of the transistor so this is essentially the same thing as the speaker terminals so the signal should very closely or identically match the output across the dummy load so let me get you zoomed in here if we can and let's see here get some things straightened out here let me turn off some lights here that's better okay so as you can see right here on the output I'm at the top of this current limiting resistor which is the same as right here this point right here and then I'm also looking at the speaker terminals so go over here and we're gonna just start at zero and we're gonna run it all the way up to clipping which is 200 watts per channel so here we go and I'm, let me turn the microphone around so that you can actually hear this amplifier because it's pretty impressive what this tr transformer sounds like I, I would hope that the speakers would drown this out but this would be really annoying to me any other way okay here we go and there we go and that was it so you can see they match up pretty good but uh, let me get you closer so you can hear this transformer And you can hear there's certain parts where that actually quiets down and actual parts where it gets louder and then parts where you can actually hear it singing at the same frequency as the one kilohertz sine wave that I'm putting into the amp. Okay, now let's look at a different part here. All right, you can see I'm right now I'm down on a little diode that's in between these two. And that diode is right here, this D. 713 so what this is is this is the input to the 70 volt rail and you you're gonna see how it works so back here is where we're picking off the feedback from the output to the speakers it comes into this little circuit here and it gets amplified through these transistors and then we're gonna look at the actual drive signal here then we're gonna go through and see the output of that 70 volt rail. So again, we're going to see what this looks like over here. All right, here we go. And you can see right now, see how it's, if I go down, 
you can see that it's kind of modulating right now and it, basically this is pulsating with that one kilohertz tone but let me go down again as I increase the volume you can see now at about halfway you can see these pulses appear and you're starting to actually see just for just for the peaks you're seeing that 70 volt line become more active uh, on the rail and as I increase the volume more and more you can see those pulses are on for longer and longer until we hit clipping so that's what's going on right there we're now looking at the output of these transit now the of these two diodes and these diodes are actually in parallel and they are right here so these are your commutating diodes and this is what separates the 43 volt rail from the 70 volt rail you can kinda see how they're put together and you can see you're gonna watch as we increase the volume how this is going to influence this down here okay so let's take a look at that okay we're set up and notice that I have not changed the scale of the scope so the voltage that we were looking at at the base of the transistors we're actually going to now look at the, va the voltage of the emitters of those transistors if you notice it follows it perfectly and there's pops in right there at about that amplitude as we go up in volume same thing so it's the same signal so really what that's telling us is that the purpose for these transistors right here are actually for current not for voltage so this is this is a pretty much a unity circuit right here all of the amplification is being done back here so you can see how this modulates the rail it, it doesn't have a lot of a lot of influence at low volumes and as you increase the volume you can see that kicking in and out okay so that's what's going on and that's how this type of amplifier works with the rail switching and whatever you want to call it and it does change with the frequency so now let's we that's with a one kilohertz tone let's change to a hundred Hertz and see if anything changes okay now I had to change the sweep time a little bit to show the 100 Hertz tone but now let's look and see what it does and you can see very quickly that the width of those pulses gets a lot wider because we're drawing more current at the lower frequency like that so let's go even lower okay I've moved my sweep time down a little bit further we're at four milliseconds per division and we have a 40 Hertz tone on there now instead of a hundred Hertz so let's see what that what that rail switching does at that frequency and you can see how odd the, the waveform starts to get at low frequencies and you see how quickly it pops open and you can see so far at very close to max power you're not getting a lot of distortion and right there you're starting to clip and you notice it's not clipping flat top anymore so we're starting to rail the system out now there is one thing to this I am still plugged into my isolation transformer and although it is a very large isolation transformer it's still gonna have a little bit of, of uh, sag to it under heavy load so part of this could be due to my transformer that's feeding this amplifier uh, you need a really solid line for this to work but e even a, a classic you know class a B amplifier with single rail big power supply big capacitors the capacitors are only going to hold for a peak moment and they're they're gonna eventually they're gonna get behind and if you're running a constant sine wave it's gonna start relying on your incoming mains at that kind of power level so now let's go the opposite direction and look at very high frequencies okay we're now up to 10 kilohertz 
So the only thing I moved now was the sweep speed again, obviously, so we can see the waveform. But here we go now. So there's our pulse. And you can kind of see what's happening here as we go up. It's actually oscillating. And this is a problem with these rail switcher type amplifiers. They really do not like high frequency. They work very well at low frequencies, but at high frequencies that rail switching can go kind of crazy. Now if you notice it didn't really too, too much adversely affect the output to the speakers, but you can see that it's kind of going crazy up there. Let's go up a little higher in the frequency. Okay, we now have 20 kilohertz, so this is pretty much the, the top of the line, top of the range for what we're going to be listening to ever. And uh, let's see what that, what that top rail does now. And you can see it doesn't like it. And it just tripped the safety, the protect. So you can see that uh, at 20 kilohertz, actually at high frequency, that uh, that circuit doesn't work real well, and that's that's one of the the inherent flaws of rail switching uh, amplifiers like this, you know, across the board. Um, and that's and that's why these are great for you know for low to mid range frequencies, but at very high frequencies, although it did keep the, I mean, if you look, the actual output itself was very clean. Little bit, a little bit, uh, kind of pointy on the on the sine wave, but not bad. But you can see what it does, and you can see how it, see those glitches. That's that is the the top rail kind of going into oscillation. So, <laughs> it really doesn't like that. So that just gives you a little idea of how this works. Now, of course, we could probably get that a little better by doing uh, by verifying the uh, the rail voltage on this because there is one pot that you can adjust for the rail voltages, and it's kind of uh, it's kind of like a bias, but it's not just a bias control, I guess, and. Uh, it might make it a little bit better but at high frequencies you're going to see that happen although you notice it did hold its own pretty well there so that's a little bit of how that circuit works let's uh, take a look a little further now okay just for fun we're gonna put the mic next to the uh, transformer we're gonna kinda listen to that triac do its thing with the amplifier running at 10 Hertz Okay, so we can actually hear it switch. Here we go. And the lights are kind of pulsating in the <laughs> on the bench at about 10 hertz, so you can imagine how much current that it's drawing. So anyway, that's pretty much how this amp works. All right, now that we've seen <clears throat> how everything works on the scope, let's take a look at some of the components. So right here is your four transistors for the <clears throat> for your high for your 70 volt rails. So that would represent these and these right here. And if you notice, they're just mounted to this flat piece of aluminum for a heat sink and it actually got warm. I mean, it didn't get hot, but it did get warm to the touch, and so did the main heat sink up here. Now, the other uh, eight transistors for the two channels, so four for this channel and four for this channel, as you can see, are mounted under here, and they're the same kinds of transistors, those uh, TO220P uh, or whatever they call them, uh, or I'm sorry, TO3P transistors I think is what those are and you can see they just solder right onto the board here 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 and so forth uh, 
and they're mounted to this heat sink up here. So, and your power just comes straight up onto the board. So this is coming out of your transformer. It has AC. It goes into those diodes that we saw on the top and your main filter caps here. Now, uh, again, maybe having a little bit higher uh, capacitor values, you know, a little better capacitance would give you a little more reserve current. Um, but I don't really know how much. Uh, you'd have to go up pretty high to get, you know, because it's diminishing returns to, you know, to get not a huge difference. So, but uh, there's really a very simple circuit when you look at it and when you break it down. It's just kind of different the way that it's wired up. Um, but all of your amplification, you know, your whole output section is just, you're looking at it, just this little section right here. So I hope uh, you enjoyed this part of the video. And uh, the next thing we're going to look at, of course, we're going to look at the tuner and then we'll look at the sonic hologram. And then we'll kind of put everything together and, you know, finalize it by kind of making an evaluation, what we think. Uh, definitely, so far, what I can say is this is definitely something different and interesting to me. Um, again, I don't really know how this is going to sound until we get it connected up to some real speakers. Uh, so, but it's definitely a really cool design. So till next time, thank you so much for everything. Thank you for all the comments and all the participation. Uh, I really didn't expect to hear so much about this thing. So uh, I hope this video kind of takes it a little further. And uh, till next time, take care, peace, joy, happiness, and good health in your lives. And wish you all the best. And we will talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.